Father, we give you praise and honor. Lord, we would, we would sense the heaviness of your spirit right now, which means that you desire to do something. Um, so we're ready, Lord. We're waiting. Help us to be obedient to your call in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. You may be seated if you'll take your seat. Some of you know that I've been a little ill the last couple of days, and I thank you for your prayers. And so if I, if I don't preach that long, no, that won't happen. Um, so if you have your Bibles, John chapter 4. And I want to do what you shouldn't do as you study your Bible, I want to parachute right into the middle of a text, of a story. So in order for me to do that, I'm going to have to tell you a little bit of the story. The Bible tells us in John chapter 4, Jesus was headed through a countryside called Samaria. Samaria was, um, in many ways, a no man's land place where it was not always safe to be. It was a place where Samaritans lived. Samaritans were uh, viewed sometimes in their day as the off-scouring, the lowlifes, the half-breeds in that, that countryside. And Jesus is headed down to Jerusalem and he is stopping by a well. And there at the well, in the middle of the day, the Bible says, in your text, it says in the ninth hour, which is noontime, Jesus is encountered with this woman of Samaria. The Bible tells us that um, she's there to water the animals, or so she says. Now, if you know anything about your Middle Eastern culture, you don't water animals in the midday. It's too hot. You water your animals in the morning and in the evening. We do that here in farming in America. And so apparently, embarrassed of her lifestyle, she goes to the well in the middle of the day. Wells were gathering places, social places, not just to get water, but to meet your neighbors, to catch up on the day's news. And so here she is by herself. She's with Jesus. The disciples have gone into the city of Sychar to pick up some Happy Meals from McDonald's. They haven't had anything to eat, and so here they are, and they get into this conversation. Jesus first says to her that he has some water. You see, he realized that the lady had come to the well with two dry containers. She came with a dry container on her shoulder to fill it with water for the animals. And she came with a dry heart that was empty of love and of God. Jesus says, I've got some water. In fact, the water that I can give you will be a spring welling forth in your heart that will never run dry. She first is caught off guard. She says, sir, you don't have anything to draw water with, and this well is pretty deep. He said, no, I'm not talking about this water. I'm talking about living eternal water she says give me some of this water now Jesus knows she's not ready yet so then he says to her hey go call your husband she says sir I don't have a husband he said you're exactly right you've had five husbands and the man that you're now living with is not your husband she says to him sir I perceive you're a prophet you know something about me. About this time, the disciples come back with the Happy Meals, and they're shocked, shocked, that Jesus is talking with this woman. Because the disciples were good Jewish boys. They knew that a good Jewish rabbi, at least, a teacher, you don't associate with a Samaritan, let alone a Samaritan woman. And here Jesus is talking with this woman. They didn't have enough sense to ask Jesus, what y'all talking about? What's the word on the streets? Go up in the hallways, the skit scat in the alleyways. 
Inquiring minds want to know Jesus. Well, the Bible says she departed. She goes back to her town just a few miles away and says, Come see a man that told me everything I ever did. Meanwhile, Jesus says this. Look in John 4, 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not say, There are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. How would you like to have Jesus come and stay in your small town for two days? The city of Sychar was a, probably a few hundred people. I grew up in a town of 450, 450, 60 people in my graduating class. The great thing about a small town is everybody knows you. The bad thing about a small town is everybody knows you. If Jesus had come to Delta, Missouri, everybody would have known it, and everybody would have been there. So Jesus is there two days, and look what happened. He's there two days, and it says in verse uh, 41, and many more believed because of his word. They first believed because of her word, now his word, and they said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this in, is indeed the Savior of the world. And after two days he parted from Galilee, for Jesus had testified that a prophet is not without honor in his hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast." So, has anybody in here ever heard of the company Legos? The Lego, anybody, anybody have any Legos at their house? How many of you do not know what a Lego is? Okay. Have you heard the story of Lego? You know, a long time ago, they put together these pieces that would interconnect. And for 60 years, the Lego company had profits. Up until 2004, 2002 or 2004. And for 60 years, which, which is remarkable for a company to have that kind of long stretch that it's profitable. No downs, it's just like, it's kind of like Chick-fil-A right now. It's just up, 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 up and away. And then something happened to the Lego company. They experienced what some have called mission drift. They decided, wow, we're really good at making Legos. Maybe we can do some things, take the, take the resources that we have, and, and maybe we can do some things that are not necessarily directly about Legos, but, but since we're doing so good, let's just do some other things. And all of a sudden, over a short period of time, the 60-year increase in profits and so on, to, and, and, their, and their theme was this, you'll love this, we want to give kids the best possible play experience. That's their theme of their company for 60 years. And then they experienced mission drift. And they still made Legos, but they also started doing other things, and profits went down, and there was infighting in the company. And then they hired a 35-year-old former academic who was still a kid at heart. And the first thing he did when he was hired is he said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to get rid of all these ancillary things that are really good. And we're going to do what we always do. We're going to make really 
good Legos. Guess what happened to prophets? Infighting in the company over this project and that project, because there weren't that many projects. There was only one project. We're going to make Legos. And we're going to make them small and we're going to make them big. I like the big ones. Don't y'all like the big ones? And the small ones. And we're going to make different things, but it's all going to be based on Legos. Now that silly story has everything to do with this text. You see, the disciples had been the understudies of Jesus. Jesus had been trying to communicate with his disciples, I have a mission. There's a lot of good things we do. He, he, he was going to heal people. That's really good. Would you, would you agree with that? That's really good. And he was going to cause the blind to see and the lame to walk. And all those things are really good. He was going to meet needs and all that's really good. But Jesus wanted to remind his disciples that his real mission was that he had come to seek and to save that which was lost. That even at his birth, Mary and Joseph were told, give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You see, this can happen to a church. It can happen to a church in that we can do a lot of really good things. A lot of good things. Instead of the one thing. You see, it, it's entirely possible for a church to have mission drift. We've, we've had some success over here, and all of a sudden we, we, we think, well, man, we'd be good at Legos. We'll go over here and do this and do that. This text reminds us that we cannot let ourselves drift from the mission God has given us. You heard me tell the story. Here Jesus is talking with this woman, doing his mission. The disciples come back. They've got the food. They're ready to eat. They still don't quite get the mission. They don't even see the mission. The, the, the original rendering of the original language here is really incredible. It's almost as if they don't even see her. They see through her. They don't even recognize she's there. Like she's non-existent. They didn't even ask. Jesus, why are you talking with this woman? And don't take that to like, oh my gosh, she shouldn't be talking. They, they come up, she's having this conversation with Jesus, and it's like she's a nobody, and they say, hey Jesus, we got, who, who gave you something to eat? They're more worried about eating than they are her soul. And Jesus gets them back on track. Inglewood Baptist Church, my message is really simple this morning. There are many things good that we can do here at our church. And we do them. We have a school of music, and that's good. We have men and women who help serve meals to shut-ins, and that's really good. We do a lot of things. But there is only one thing that God has called us to. And that is to share the gospel with every person so that they might know Jesus. That is the mission. Look what Jesus says, and I just have four or five things I don't want to share with you and what the consequences were. Number one, what is the mission of God? Look, if you will, in verse 41, I think it is. Look at verse 41. Notice, they, or verse 31, I'm sorry. Verse 31, they come back, Rabbi, eat. And he says, I'm not hungry. They said, is anything giving you, giving you something to eat? And he said, my, my food is to do the will of my Father. That, 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 that's what the mission is. The mission is to do our Father's will. And our Father's will is to save Sinners. That's the will of the Father. Are there things that come along with that? You better believe it. But that's the will of the Father. In fact, the Bible says before the 
foundations of the earth were made. We were chosen in him in Christ. Get, get your brain around that one. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that he was crucified before the foundations of the world. Get your brain around that one. It, it, in other words, it tells me that the mission, the will of the Father is not plan B. It is eternal. And Jesus said, it's the will of the Father. That's the mission. Notice number two. The will of the Father, of the mission is to not make any more excuses. Notice what Jesus said. Jesus said, my will is to do the will of my Father. And the will of my Father is to save people. And then he says, and do not yet say there are yet three or four months until the harvest. You see, here's the thing about me. Anybody, do we have any here, we have any uh, delay tactic people here? Do we have any... Um, people that kind of put things off. We have any procrastinators? You know, I'm, I'm, I'll do that tomorrow, I'll do that tomorrow. And, and here's the amazing thing. Jesus knew what was in the heart of His disciples. When He said, now my will is to do the will of the one who sent me, my Father, and obviously that's right here in front of your eyes. It is the will of my Father to share living water with this woman. That satisfies me. And Jesus knew it would be so easy to start making excuses. Well, not Jesus, you know, she's, she's, she's a Samaritan. And we, we can't be hanging around Samaritans. Now, Jesus, you know she's been married five times. And the guy she's living with, like they're shacking up. They're, they're, they're living in sin. You, you can't be, you're holy, you can't be. Jesus, you, you know we're... We're just passing through. We're, we're just passing through. We're, we're just, you, we're headed somewhere else. We don't have time. We, we, gotta, we gotta go lean and mean. We're on our way somewhere. Jesus knew that it would be real easy to start making excuses. And so, you know what he said? My will is to do the will of him who sent me. Don't make excuses. Don't, don't yes say there are four or five months. Start now. You say, Pastor, I want to do the will of my Father. Good. Start now. Well, Pastor, I don't understand everything. Start right now. Well, Pastor, I don't have it all figured out. Neither do I. Well, Pastor, what if I'm asked a question I don't know the answer to? Just tell him you don't know the answer to it. Well, Pastor, I, 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 I've, never, I've never shared the gospel before. Start what if I stick my foot in the mouth, join the rest of us? Pastor, what if, what if they say no? That's okay, you're just a delivery boy, just deliver the message. Well, Pastor, what, we, we start making all those kind of excuses, and all of a sudden we have excused ourselves out of doing the will of the Father. What's the mission of the church? To do the will of the Father and to stop making excuses. Oh, listen... We, we're so divided now as a country and we're right and left and up and down and silly and crazy. Well, that's true. That's still not an excuse. Here's the biggest excuse of all. They won't be saved. But we live in a day where Jesus, everybody's already turned against Jesus. That's not true. That's not true. Open your mouth and share the gospel. Number three, it's the mission of the disciples and us to not only to do the will of the Father and to stop making excuses, but it's the mission of the church to lift up our heads and start looking. Stop looking down and start looking up. Man. Is it so easy? Oh, Brother Kevin, you don't know. Nobody knows. Hey, look, there's a dime over there. Look, at there's a dime. Got a dime. And many of us go through life looking down. I do that. My, that's my tendency. I'm on a mission. I'm going 
to Kroger, whether you like it or not. Don't get in my way. I got my list. I'm going in. Don't be saying hi to me. I got a mission. I got to get the bread on the thing. I got to get back and there. And here we go. And God may have an appointment for me in aisle two. Jesus, Jesus is not talking theoretically. He's talking to the disciples. They didn't see this woman. Oh, they saw her physically. She was there. But they just saw right through her. She was a non-person. She didn't matter. Jesus said, boys, lift up your eyes. Lift up your heads. Open your eyes. She's right in front of you begging for water. And you're worried about a happy meal. When I read this, I, this week, I just got all over me. How many people do we not see? And I wrote down a list. Who do we see? Everybody. When do we see them? All the time. Why should we see them? They need the Lord. How should we see them? As somebody who could come to faith in Christ. I don't always see like that. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't. I'm like you. I look at them and I sometimes think about their lifestyle and I sometimes think about their, and it disgusts me. And then the Holy Spirit, you know how the Holy Spirit is. Don't be messing with the Holy Spirit. Here's what the Holy Spirit will do to you. The Holy Spirit will bring to you your mind, Matthew 9, 35 through 38. And it says, and Jesus went through all the towns and villages, preaching in their marketplaces, preaching in their synagogues. And when he looked on all of these people, he was moved with compassion. <clears throat> I'll give you the illustration of this. I, I had come back from the hospital one day and I was coming across town and I decided to get off at Trinity Lane. And I came to the end of the exit ramp and that Trinity Lane is a pretty rough section. And I got off uh, there and I went down to Dickerson Road and I'm sitting there at the stoplight and right across the street is a bus bench. A bus bench. And um, on that bench is a beautiful young lady, but she's dirty. Her hair is kind of matted. She's trying to, I guess, the best she could make herself pretty. You could, if you've lived around here a long time, you, you obviously know that she... It was in the morning. She probably had been plying her trade. That little section there is known for that. And at first, I thought, what a despicable. That's what she. And the Lord, I mean, jerked a knot in my tail. Hey. Kevin, you got a daughter? Yeah, that's somebody's daughter. She probably hates what she does. But through a series of decisions that, yes, are her responsibility, it made me want to just put my car and park and just cause a traffic jam, I, I got this sensation, I already just walk across the media and say, ma'am, I don't know you, I don't mean anything ill will of it, I'm not trying to be crazy, I just want you to know that God loves you. There is a man in this world and out of this world, his name is Jesus, and he doesn't want your body, he wants your soul. That's how we got to see them. Lift up your heads. That's the will. That's the mission. 
That's the mission. They're going to come in all kinds, with all kinds of brokenness. They're going to come from everywhere. And, and if we're the kind of church that kind of has our guards up, that, that, that you know, you can only come in here if you, if you look nice, you can only come here if, you, if you're all buttoned up. If you, you can only come in here if you all have it all together. Then we're not going to reach anybody. Jesus said, lift up your heads. Open your eyes. She's right here. <clears throat> Look what else he says. He says, know that the harvest is ready. The harvest is ready. There are souls that are ready now. Right now. I, I don't know who they are. I don't know who they are, but where they are, but it could be today when you eat lunch. It could be this week. It, they're always ready. Th then look what else Jesus says. Jesus says, enter the work. Just get out there and enter the work. I love this passage. In fact, look at John 4, and I love the way he says this. It's kind of a messed up way to say this, but look, Jesus knows what he's doing. Look what he says there in verse 36. He said, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. In other words, Jesus says, just get in the game. The harvest is already good. The reapers and sowers and waterers and people who are doing the stuff. Just, you, well, where do I get in? Just dive in. Just dive in. Well, what, what am I going to do? Well, you, you, you may be there to till the soil. Break up the file. God may use you to start a conversation with somebody whose heart is hard and the Holy Spirit's going to use your words and all of a sudden they're going to be more open and then all of a sudden somebody's going to come along that, that has gospel seed and they're going to plant the seed and, and, and it's not yet ready and, and then there's going to, somebody comes along with an act of kindness and they're going to water that seed and all of a sudden, boom, it's going to grow and then somebody comes along and they think they're all that because they open their mouth and they come to faith in Christ and say, look what I did. No, you didn't do it. God did it and all the things that led up to it but they, but you can't have a harvest and let you do all those things that lead up to it. Jesus said the mission is to just jump in. Jump in. Sometimes you might be a laborer. Sometimes you may water. Sometimes you may do this or that. Sometimes you may fertilize. Sometimes you may plow. Sometimes you may weed to keep the weeds out of it, to keep the conversation going. That's the mission. That's the mission. That's the mission. Well, what was the consequence? Let me give you four. One, the truth was told. The truth was told to this woman. She went back to her hometown to see everything I've ever done. Number two, a soul was saved. A woman was saved. Number three, a town was transformed. I, I find this rather remarkable. That this woman, now, now let, me, let me ask you this. If you lived an embarrassed, shame-filled life. You know, we talk about bullying these days. We, we talk about bullying and bullying's not good. You think this woman was bullied in the town of Sychar? I guarantee you she was. I guarantee you she was. You lived on the other side of the tracks. Everybody knew your name. They knew what you did. They knew your business. They knew you were probably this or that or whatever you want to call her. And you know what she did? She was so transformed. I, I find this utter remark. This only Jesus can do this. She marches right back into her place of shame and announces the gospel. That is unbelievable. Only Jesus can do that. So not only was the truth told when they were on mission, not only was a woman converted, but a whole town was transformed. They said, man, we'll go, dude, that's, let's go out and see if he'll stay here. Jesus comes back in. Man's <laughs> preaching the word. And you know what they said? You know, at first we believe because of what you said, but now we believe because we, we heard it from him. This is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Let me tell you something else too that's interesting. A door was open. You see, preacher, what, what door was open? 
You notice that little phrase down there in verse 44? He leaves there and goes to Galilee because he left his hometown area. You know why he left his hometown area? Because they didn't have any respect for what he was doing. And yet, God opened the door. God opened a door. And it was a door that wasn't previously open, but along the sovereign purposes of God, if you can't minister in your hometown, God will open the door. And he did, and he went to Galilee. And by the way, he made that his headquarters for the rest of his ministry. So, as I close today, you got a mission? Anybody ever heard of um, Apple? Anybody ever heard of Apple? In fact, I want to give you an illustration here. Uh, I brought my phone here because I was going to tell myself how long not to preach. This is an iPhone. I know some of you have a lesser phone of some kind. I just, I just relax. And you heard of Steve Jobs. Let me tell you another story of mission drift. Uh, now, I know Steve Jobs uh, is notorious for, he was notorious for his personality. He since died of cancer and so on, but uh, he, was, he was a piece of work. But he was a visionary, and he had one vision. And it wasn't to produce great technology. I, I thought it was. But it was actually to give the customer the best, easiest possible experience. So uh, all I got to do is put my... Remember all those crazy C prompts? Remember those... Some of you who miss C... You don't even know what I'm talking about, okay? All those old... Oh, you know, C prompts. Well, guess what I got to do? I just press there and there's all my apps, right? And if I want to go to a news site... And uh, I can do that right there, right there. Well, something happened. The uh, illustrious board of Apple uh, got into it with Steve Jobs, and uh, probably rightly so, and they fired him from his own company. And they started focusing on the technology. They, they forgot the experience experience so they they had all this great technology but the but the but the products they would give you you couldn't hardly work them and you you cuss them and throw them down and throw them out and i'm gonna i'm gonna go buy a, a nokia or whatever you call it and guess what happened to prices and started bombing out it just went down so with their tail between their legs, they went back to Steve Jobs. They said, hey, would you come back to the company? Well, why? Well, we kind of got off target here. Mission drift. And I watched it early this morning again, his inaugural speech coming back. You know what he says? He goes, guys, in fact, one guy stands up and says, what you're doing is going to cause me to lose my job. And there's a pause, and he stands up and he goes, man, I'm really sorry about that. But we only do one thing. We, we make great customer experiences. And what you do is great. I'm sure you'll be able to get a job, but it won't be here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put out iPhones, we're going to put out iPads, and so on. And immediately, it's one of the record all-time turnarounds of a company. You, whether you like them or not, they're there, and it just skyrocketed. What would happen if we invited the Lord Jesus back into his church, gave him the platform, said, hey, Jesus, we've kind of gotten off track here? I wonder what Jesus would say. You know what I think he'd say? Y'all had a little mission drift, worried about a lot of different things. There's one mission. 
And even the things that we do that are out here that are really good, everything needs to feed to that mission. Everything needs to feed to that mission. And it's to get the gospel to every person. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Would you stand if you would? Do you know the Lord? I would be remiss if even now you thought I was talking about somebody else. Uh, And maybe the Lord has been dealing with you that you feel like that woman that everybody was seeing through, not seeing at her. and, And I pray that you would turn from your sins and give your life to the Savior. That's what it means to become a Christian. Very simple. Father, I am a sinner. I now turn from my sin and I turn to the Savior. And with the enabling help of the Holy Spirit, He will save you. He will save you. In fact, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're not a Christian, would you pray that prayer under your breath, in your heart? Would you pray that with me? Father, I turn from my sin. And I turn by faith to Jesus as my Savior. Save me. Forgive me right now. Father, you've heard the prayer of someone in this room. And I pray now that you would give them the courage to maybe to make that public so that we can rejoice with them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.